The Summer Birds by Penelope Farmer, Part 2, 9. The four children walked happily down the beach together, watching the gulls skimming the waves. They dropped sheer down from the cliff jutting above them and dodged among the crests of the rising waves. I would like to do that, said Charlotte to the boy, quite serious. We can, he answered her, but it's hard. Will you try? Emma said hurriedly, looking at the great fall from the cliff. I think I'm going to look for shells. And Charlotte, too, was frightened. It was not usually she who thought of doing such things. Usually it was the gymnasts, such as Marley and Bandy. But they were not here now. The sea was fierce and active, swelling forth and back, and the rocks were jagged. But still she wanted it. Yes, I'll try, she said, looking at the boy wide-eyed. Maggot gave Charlotte a wise look. Yes, she said. You should try. It's your place. But it's not mine. Not now. Come on, Emma. We'll find shells. And they went back up the beach, searching bent over the ground. They won't find much with the tide this high, said the boy, looking back after them. Then he smiled at Charlotte. Are you frightened? he asked. But he was not mocking her as he might have been, nor did he wait for an answer. They flew to the top of the cliff, and it was a hard flight, like a climb steeply upward, pushing with feet and hands while the face of the cliff fell below them. At the top, Charlotte collapsed, exhausted, on the short springy grass and lay panting. Come on, said the boy, soon there will be no time. She went with him to the edge of the cliff, where the heather fell away and there was only rock. You could not fall far from here, for just below them a wide ledge jutted out. It was from this that the gulls fell like stones to the sea. Some of them sat motionless now, and all over the ledge were traces of others, draggled feathers and white stains. The gulls were surprisingly tame. At least they made no move away from the two watching them. Charlotte felt that the boy was so familiar to them, they had no need to fear. All that they showed now was interest. Smooth, rounded shapes hunched on matchstick legs. They swiveled their heads back to front to pin the two with beady eyes and pointed greedy beaks. The boy nodded to Charlotte to stay on the cliff top, and himself dropped down onto the ledge where the gulls were. He spoke to them in his soundless language, and they heard him, beady-eyed and motionless. Come, said the boy upward to Charlotte, and she too slithered down to the gull rock. Come, he said again and drew her to the edge. The cliff fell away to the sea, down and down to the moving water, where waves appeared, wrinkles on a contour map, and the toothy rocks, harmless stones, waiting to be skimmed across the water like pebbles from a beach. Charlotte's stomach did not seem to belong to her. The wind dragged back her hair and scoured her face, and in her ears was the sigh of the distant sea and the trickle of a tiny stream, which fell from the top to the bottom of the cliff. Come, said the boy gently. You do want to come, he asked nervously, as she stood silent and frightened, looking at the space lined by sea. Charlotte, at that moment, did not want to go in the least, but she could not disappoint him now. Hearing the anxiety in his voice, she looked up, not smiling, and said, Yes, but how? The boy said, The gulls will show us. I have asked them. We must watch what they do, and when they halt their fall, we must halt ours. They will halt it a little before they usually do. They will halt a little before they usually do, because we are larger, and you are inexperienced, and then you must swerve immediately into the waves. Can you do it, do you think? Charlotte said her stomach turning inside Charlotte said, her stomach turning inside out. Is it dangerous? The boy looked at her. His face was beaked and stern. The first time, he said, yes, you could misjudge it. And then, perhaps I shouldn't ask you to come, Charlotte. I had forgotten a little of a little what it was like. He was furiously anxious that she should not that she would not come. She could not bear to disappoint him. Half of her, anyway, dragged to go, even if the other half, the timid flesh half, dragged back. I am coming, she said, her voice rising sharply. Let's go, she added, trying to be carefree. The wall of her trembled. Yes, then we go, said the boy, smiling at her smiling at her his best and unmocking smile she was delighted by the she was so delighted by this that she almost stepped straight off the cliff without thinking any more but the boy came back to her wait for the gulls he said 
He beckoned and they jerked forward on slender legs to stand beside them on the cliff edge. Charlotte now was conscious of nothing but fear seizing her, cold, shivering, icy fear. The wind caught her skirt, her hair. Hard rock was still beneath her feet. And then, suddenly almost unaware, she left the rock and was plummeting. Boy, birds with her, plummeting stone-like seaward in a rush of air. It wasn't mere falling. She had to use some of her powers of flight to make it a controlled and not a helpless fall. Even so, she went so fast that she could hardly sense the speed except by the great pressure on her ears as she went down. The wind was wholly in her. Her body belonged to it. There were only her thoughts left falling from the cliff. She forgot everything, even the boy, though her ears hurt more and more. She felt as if her head would burst like a balloon. She ignored it, thought only of this ecstasy. On and on and on, but there was sound. Wind caught somewhere. She looked around in an ease of movement that came once the first fear had gone. Stop, stop, came the noise. Suddenly she realized that it was the boy, frantic, moving his hands at her down to the rushing sea. It was very near, leaping to meet her, and the gulls had stopped, swerved up. She was frightened again, but she jerked her whole body like a brake, jarred it through and through and hovered, trembling level, but the sea, the rocks, rushed up no more. She had stopped just in time, a few feet above the jagged rock teeth that formed a chain from the cliff like a necklace, more dangerous than diamonds. All of her ached numbly, she followed the boy along the waves and dodged in them, her arms stretched out like wings splattered by the salt spray, feeding on wind and salt, turning into a trough and rising just in time to skim the crest of the next sea green wave. That was exciting too, but not so good at that ear-pressed fall. But not so good as that ear-pressed fall. Nothing would ever be as good as that. Not even the next fall when she tried again to act as a gull. Not even that was as good, though this time she remembered to stop and slid from fall to flight without jarring. Nothing would ever be like that first drop to the sea, down like a gull falling seaward from the cliff. It had been the best, yet somehow the saddest happening of her whole life but she could explain neither the happiness nor the sadness. Meanwhile, as she dodged among the waves, the boy and the gulls came out on a, sh came on a shoal of little leaping fish and dived greedily, swallowing them whole as they caught them. But the thought of the raw fish sickened Charlotte. Silently, she, she dodged as the gulls screamed around her. What fishwives they sounded. What vulgar birds. Yet it was they who owned this pure falling from a cliff down to the surging sea, their white bodies streamlined as motors. Even after they left the sea and went to find the others, Charlotte remained silent. Emma bubbled with questions. What was it like? Was it frightening? Could I have, have come too? In fact, I wish I had now. It looked super. But Charlotte answered her only briefly, sometimes, a lo sometimes longing to talk about the fall, a longing to talk about the fall came over her. But when she opened her mouth to try and explain, someone was sure to say, oh, look at those fishes, or the gulls are making an awful lot of noise now, things that had no part in what she wanted to say and that stopped her being able to say them. Emma's questions ceased quite soon. Maggot had never even, even asked any. She looked at Charlotte, brown-eyed, and Charlotte knew that Maggot understood without words what she could not explain. So did the boy. He hardly talked to her again that day but sometimes he smiled, his nicest, unmocking smile. The cockle-shell freckles stretched wide on his face. And that is the end of chapter 9.